When you're photographing the natural world, light is everything. If there's no light, there's no picture. And what you're taking a photograph of is light reflecting from objects. The objects themselves don't give off light, but they can give off very different color of light depending on the time of day and all sorts of other factors. So I'm, if anything, more aware of the light than I am of the scenery. I'm always looking where one color of light will key off of another. You find that especially at dawn and dusk. I think a lot of people are tempted just to take a picture of a sunrise and to focus in on the warm colors of a sunrise. But when I go to places like the Eastern Sierra and photograph the mountains, I'm looking for a place where I can key the warm sunrise off of a mountain peak against the deep blue shadows. And I can have that, that visual tension between the deep blue and the the rich warm crimson that will come at the first uh, minute or so of light. And you may not perceive that deep blue. If you're in the middle of it, your eyes uh, through your brain will automatically color balance it and, and make you think that it's normal light. Wherever you are, your eyes neutralize the color balance. So when you're out of doors, you need to think in the language of film and see like film. And when you do that, then you can begin to perceive pictures that are in your mind that will come out very differently than what you're seeing with your eyes. Oftentimes we aren't aware of the differences between warm and cool light. And cool light comes from scattering. When you look up in the sky, the sky is blue. And it's blue because all the warm light has been scattered away and all that's left is the blue light. And if you're in shadows, that aren't lit directly by the sun, then they're lit by the blue light in the sky. And so they're what we call cool light. If you're uh, in direct light around sunrise or sunset, then that light becomes very warm because by the same process, a lot of the light rays have been scattered away, leaving only the warmest light to be transmitted. So when you can find the edges between the warm light and the cool light, that's where you find the most visually exciting pictures. When I first began shooting landscapes, I used to think that uh, you're stuck with whatever light you got. And that was all there was to it. And now I realize that you really do have a chance to control natural light. That you can look at something like this and figure, okay, I like that shadow. And then you can use a polarizer or a choice of film or things like that or, or the angle that you choose to really control how that comes out on film and you're not stuck with, with, uh, with one way of looking at it. Just because nature deals you a hand doesn't mean that you can't play with it. And as a photographer that gives me a sense of power and creativity that I didn't have when I first started. I thought well I'm just taking my camera and lifting it up and taking a picture of what I see. But now I'm going around and I'm looking for that light to be just right and to do what's in my mind's eye. And so I have a sense of control. One thing I've learned over the years, and that's never to try to force photography. If things aren't working for you, think, okay, this isn't working. How can I move into what will work? So when light isn't working for me, I think, okay, how will the light that is here work for a picture that I can make. And when a sky is very rich in blue, that means that uh, there's not much scattering happening and you have the opportunity to get the differences between warm and cool light and very strong directional lighting that will have strong shadows in your photographs. But when the sky is very pale, either a very pale blue or when it's overcast, then you have very even lighting. And in those situations, broad landscapes don't work very well. And you're not going to have differences in color in light. But you're going to have such even lighting that it's a wonderful time to photograph people's faces. It's a wonderful time to, to make close-ups of flowers, to do all sorts of things that you can't do in harsh, strong, hard light. In the natural world, edges are some of the most exciting things to photograph. The edges of light look much more solid on film than they do to your eye. And oftentimes you can find situations where the edge of a shadow or the edge of the different colors of light uh, on film will 
look very similar to the edge of a form. So I'm always looking for those places where I can surprise people and have a boundary of light and then a boundary of form and one edge meets the other. And it's not an obvious thing to do. You usually don't think that the edge of a, of a cloud at sunset to the sky can match the edge of the landscape or the curve of the landscape or the way a, a curved limb of a tree goes into the sky. But if you're very aware of matching light to form, then you can accentuate that form. You can make that form be stronger in your viewer's eye. We've all had the experience of seeing what would be wonderful photographs, just natural events of light and form, and we go, wow, isn't that fantastic? I wish I had my camera. I have those things happen to me, and I miss a lot of photos, too. And the only photos that I really get that count for me are ones where I've anticipated the light. Because if I see it happen, and I go, wow, I wish I had my camera, it's too late. I have to have sensed that that was going to happen, to have gotten myself into position, and to have known uh, that something about like that was going to occur. And one of the times when I was very lucky, but as Louis Pasteur once said, chance favors the prepared mind, uh, was in Yosemite Valley. And I saw that with each passing day, the light was falling off of a cliff on Yosemite El Capitan while the light was staying on a waterfall. And that it kept doing this later and later in the day. And I realized, hey, there's going to be a day when the wall is in complete shadow and the water coming out from the wall is hit by red sunset light right at the moment of sunset. And then the next day, the sunset light won't hit the water. Because as the sun moves day by day and sets a little bit different spot in the horizon, then it just moves around. And so on the right day, I was there, and it happened. Uh, and within just a matter of 30 seconds, the light was full on the water, and it was like a neon sign. It was a glowing red column of water that lit back into the shadowed cliff. And then just as quickly as it happened, it uh, turned off. The, as the sun tucked around the corner, it just went up the column of water, and the magic show was gone. I think that a lot of people have the wrong idea what professional nature photographers do. I'm not patient. I would never sit somewhere and wait days for light to happen, or even hours for light to happen. But I would go scout a place in the afternoon, or perhaps the day before, figure out, okay, what time are things going to happen here, where do I want to be, and come back 20 minutes before the light was going to be about right, and wait and watch for that period of time. So when you see a photograph and you think how lucky a person was to be in the right place at the right time, chances are that photographer wasn't just lucky. That photographer figured out where to be before being in the right place at the right time. Machu Buchari is one of the most beautiful mountains in Nepal. And I spent three weeks walking around it, around the entire Annapurna Massif, seeing Machu Buchari many times, but never getting the image that I wanted. The mountain has a classic Matterhorn-like form, and I uh, thought, if I have this in, in really warm light, it's going to look beautiful. When will I have that? At dawn. Uh, and what can I have in the bottom part of the frame? Uh, and I looked at the scenery and thought about things. I thought, how about an individual tree? So I went and found the tree that I wanted, and I found the, the point of view to put the image together. And I purposely thought about putting the tree off-center with a mountain because I didn't want to relate the two exactly together because there was no direct relation between the two. And in nature, things that are a little bit random, if they aren't related, look better in a photograph than if you artificially bring them together. And then I went out in the morning and waited for the warm light to touch the top of the peak and move down and down and down until it was just at the point before it touched the top of the tree. And then I had my tree in the whole lower part of the image in blue cool light and the mountain in warm light. And the whole image came together. In any situation, no matter how complex the light is, you'll always look towards a light source. And in a photograph, you'll always look towards the brightest thing in the photograph. And so if it's not your subject, then you better watch out. 
If you've got a person's uh, uh, face with snow around it, you better pull in really tight on that face so that there isn't too much white area around to, to distract it. And the same thing happens when you're photographing natural landscapes. You're really making a portrait of nature. And you, I think about landscapes the same way I think about taking portraits. I'm looking at the natural world. I love the natural world, and I want to make the most beautiful rendering, the most beautiful portrait that, that conveys an emotional sense in the same way as if I were photographing a person.